Um, so I was just trying to describe a little bit this um, strange creature, which is, uh, which is DAR, um, as a combination of an art residency and um, an architectural studio. And I think it was also the way for us to actually um, live in our projects. Um, I think uh, one of the, of course, the difficulties in Palestine is always to follow the horror that, you know, it's constantly produced by the news. Um, but Dar had the ambition of uh, also setting up its own agenda, its own uh, priorities. And, and one of the very um, uh, important uh, point, one of our important ambition is to think the day after the revolution, which means in our case, to think what will happen um, after um, the colonization, what will happen after the occupation is, uh, is gone. So um, in that sense, we also try to operate in the present, but always thinking about uh, this day after. And um, tonight I'm going to take you in some of you know, the projects, three, four projects that in a way trying to envision um, this sort of um, future. But before doing that, um, let's see if uh, I can move this. All right. Before doing that, I guess I, um, I have to do very quickly, I want to take you in this geography uh, a little bit. So that's, in a way, of course, this is mainly um, a spatial conflict, and therefore it's also important, maybe for some of you already familiar with this region, but I think it's important just to, very briefly, I will not uh, you know, take so much time on doing that, but just to give you a sense of the context in which this project are taking place. It's just as a series of, of maps that trying to show that as since 1948, with the partition of Palestine, how a sense of the Arab space and the Palestinian space has been reduced and, and shrinking. Um, Sari Hanafi, there is a Palestinian sociologist, uh, trying to coin a term that he called the spatial site in order to describe a specific way in which this Israeli colonization project is aiming to kill any possibility of a Palestinian space. And I think through these maps, in a way, we also see that from the partition of, of Palestine until uh, today, in which you have a series of, uh, um, of enclaves. This is a little bit represented now on specifically in the 90s, in which all the negotiations was, in fact, it's, I think it's important to remember, was mainly on the 20% of the historical Palestine. I think this is just, again, maybe some of you are very familiar with that, but I think it's important to remember that during the 90s, the negotiations was only you know, about 20%. So the Palestinians were negotiating already uh, only on 20% that was left. In this 20%, you had uh, already 60%, there was the Area C, that was under fully Israeli control. So this created a very complicated geography that in our previous work, we tried to conceptualize in these two uh, maps. The first map on the left, it's a, a system that we call the system of archipelagos. Archipelagos is this figure of islands that are connected to each other. And these are mainly Israeli cities and um, Israeli settlements. And the other one is a system of enclaves. And of course, the difference has to do with the connection. Okay? So on one side, you have settlements in Israeli cities that basically live already in one state. And the other side, you have a different islands, different enclaves, they are completely disconnected. So if you have to imagine you know, this figure, I think this was the aim of trying to visualize the figure of archipelagos as a way, in fact, uh, in this case, as the sea, um, that is in, uh, in a way preventing Palestinians to, to move from one city uh, to the other. So um, every time that each Palestinian city is closed, you know, it's enough to put a checkpoint and then you cannot uh, get out from, uh, from the city. Um, the wall, which is the red line that you see, incarcerating, is just the last of a several devices that the Israeli state used to control 
the Palestinian movements. Okay, so we have to see the, the wall only as uh, the more picturesque, if you like, uh, device that already was in a way planned to reduce uh, this um, the Palestinian in specific uh, in specific areas. However, in this um, very uh, complicated geography, if you remember, and I will take you a little bit through stories now. So in 2005, if you remember, there was a very um, important moment. It was the moment in which, uh, for several reasons, but mainly for military reasons, um, th at that time, the um, Adel Sharon, the Prime Minister of Israel, decided to um, redraw from uh, Gaza. Um, if you remember, in fact, this you know, didn't meant, of course, the, the idea of um, giving up the occupation, but it was a way, in a way, to, uh, uh, to redraw some of the settlers that, uh, that were there. And this was, for us, a very important moment, you know, which, again, architecture and space played a very important role. If you remember, there was a lot of discussion, and this discussion was about of the possible reuse of the Israeli colonies at that time. And this was an extremely important discussion, because through that, you understand also the, the role that architecture played in the conflict. So, um, and there were several propositions um, in um, possibility to reuse these Israeli colonies, possibility to, um, uh, to demolish them, um, so what uh, then was the side? It was actually to completely demolish them. And the main reason was a, a bit at that time explained by uh, Netanyahu, which is the actual uh, prime minister of Israel. At that time he said that basically he didn't want to communicate you know, to the Israeli public, he didn't want to show in a sense, he didn't want to see images of Palestinian taking over uh, Israeli um, houses. Um, and he said, mainly because this would mean the possibility of undoing the entire Zionist project, which means if you know, the Palestinians will go and re-inhabit these houses, this will mean that actually, this can actually happen in the future. Um, so all of this discussion, in a way, lead us to try the first project to speculate about um, the possible reuse of these Israeli colonies. So one option as the option of Gaza, was the idea to demolish them. And this is also was emotionally also for Palestinians an option, maybe the most important option, because you know, the idea that you demolish these Israeli uh, colonies, that is the embodiment of, of the injustice, is the embodiment of the expropriation, will mean also that suddenly in, you know, in, in one single act you can get rid of what is symbolized. But in fact, as we know, in Gaza, you know, the occupation remained, and most importantly, the rebels you know, is still there. And in fact, was not the way of, um, you know, getting rid of um, of this architecture. Um, at the same time, we start to uh, um, speculate on the idea of possible reuse. But we also know, and especially I think in this context, you have an incredible example, how dangerous it's just to reuse this kind of architecture. Because what is in this organization of the space is the embodiment of, of controlling, is the embodiment of certain ideologies. Um, and if also the debate was very important also here in India at the moment you know, of independence in which you, know, you had to decide if what to do with, for example, um, you know, left uh, governmental building. Are you re-inhabiting them as a government and therefore using architecture as a powerful tool to actually uh, express power or actually as was in certain cases the, uh, the proposition of Gandhi was actually to change them, means to change their function to subvert them. And this was the option that we start to um, a little bit work on. And this is just an example of what does it mean, for example, uh, trying to um, completely subvert the use that was uh, planned. Um, I will go back to that, but this was a tower, a watchtower. It's, Palestine is full of this uh, watchtower. And it's really at the entrance of uh, Bethlehem. And in 2007, uh, the, the military base was um, evacuated. So, um, in that very moment, um, Imad al Atrash, which is the um, director of the Palestinian Wildlife Association, jumped on the tower and used the tower, which is essentially an optical device, for a completely different function. And this was for us illuminating, because which means not reusing a military base, 
as a military base for the Palestinians, but actually using a military base, in this case, for its optical um, properties, uh, in this case, to actually transform this in an environmental building and uh, in, um, in a bird watching station. I will go back to that, but just to somehow make clear about this, you know, three hypotheses that we uh, start to work on. Um, so I will just move um, between these two um, case studies. The first is in the north of Jerusalem, which is a settlement called Pesagot. And the other one is this military base that uh, was evacuated, which is in the south. And we live actually um, down uh, here. This is Bethlehem, Beth Sahur, and the military base is very much close, and we can see it from our studio and uh, our window. So here I, I will go very, very fast, because also we want to um, describe more recent projects. These are projects that uh, were very much at the beginning of, um, of DAR. Um, one of the main issues when we started to speculate and start to have meetings with, uh, with people, with municipalities, with associations, um, about um, you know, how to reuse this colony after you know, there will be um, their evacuation, one of, of course, the central uh, element was the land, the property uh, of the land. So, um, one thing that uh, the first operation, therefore, was to overlap an old parcelization, a parcelization of uh, before the, uh, the, the settlements were established in the 80s, and to see how, uh, in a way, these two um, different way of use of the lands were, in fact, overlapping uh, one to, uh, to another. One thing that needs to be said, that most of the Israeli settlements are on top of the hill, but also are built on common land. So here, just a, a footnote of the importance of how, um, Israel, the Israel, since the establishment of Israel, all the traditional form of communal land has been flattened into one single category, which is the state land. And this is, I think it's very important because in a way, it was a way to expropriate with the idea, with using the public, which is, you know, most of the time we think that the public is for the benefit of everybody. But in this case, I think make evident how sometimes in this colonial context, the public was actually used for colonial expropriation against what people had in common. Because all of these lands were lands that in a way were different way of uh, owning and using the land um, as, um, as a collective space. But in order to establish the settlements, this then uh, was, was established as a, as a public, uh, as a public uh, land. So overlapping these two systems, in a way, was for us to start to think about how these two systems will create a completely different reality. You know? Try to simulate. Let's imagine that you own this one piece of land. So this piece of land will be given back to you, and most likely these lines that before were separating different parcels will actually cut randomly what you know, uh, the colony was, uh, was built on. Um, and this is where, through this first of operation, one thing that we start to propose and to work with some NGOs, it was actually a manual of architectural decolonization. So one of the big things that always uh, the Israeli government trying to say, say, you know, this, this is impossible, you cannot actually change things. But through the manual of decolonization, we were actually de wanted to demonstrate exactly the opposite, is to say, if um, there is a political will, will to actually evacuate these places, I think we can actually um, make a, um, exercise in imagining how these places could give back to the collectivity. So since they are built, most of them, in, the, in these collective uh, uh, spaces, so the idea for us was actually to try to imagine them um, back to for uh, collective uh, uses. That can be schools, can be um, anything that could actually um, be serving uh, the Palestinian community or the surrounding community. And the other element that I think was also very important for us was very much the ground. So one of the operations we described in this manual of decolonization was the ungrounding. Because for us, was, the problem was not the single individual house. You know, that is, you know, typically is this horrible architecture you can see here. And of course, here there is a lot of things that can be said about the language of this architecture. You know? We are in the... Um, you know, in, in, in a place in which there is 
you know, rarely rains, uh, but as you can see, the red roof are one of these elements that um, operate at several levels. One is the imagination that is linked to Europe in some form, even though in Europe in itself this is look more like a traditional element. But the red roof, for example, is also used by the militaries when they have to bomb Palestinian houses to recognize, because the red roof are the colonies, Palestinians built mainly terraces, okay? Because for them, it's how you layer one after the other so that in a way that the family can expand. So in a way, the, the architecture itself is of course used also for a specific military uh, purposes. So for us, what was important, this you see the relation, what I just tried to mention, it's, um, this is the settlements with the red roof, and you see it's, it's layered very much like an American gated community. And the other side you have Ramallah. Ramallah is this informal uh, city that's uh, you know, sp sp uh, spread until... It, it, so and as you can see, the, the relation is, is actually... Uh, they, are, they are very close, but at the same time, they are completely separated. So one of the first of operations that we're trying to explore in this manual it was imagining that the, the first centimeter of this ground, this is the ground that needs to be completely destroyed. Uh, because otherwise means that you keep the same way so that one of the danger would be that the settlements will be evacuated and instead of having Israeli settlers living there in this secluded life, lifestyle, you now have the Palestinian elite. And again, post-colonial um, you know, um, time in Algeria, here and other places, in fact, demonstrate how this trap is, is one of the things that most like what can happen, you know, that in a way architecture has this sort of inertia that is easy for the elite. And in fact, when we started to have this conversation, there were already, you know, companies, Palestinian, Palestinian companies that would love actually to have this compound for them and to be separated from, uh, from the rest of, um, of the city. So these are just uh, some of this image that's trying to, um, uh, to visualize. So the first one, uh, the result was this idea of, of a manual of decolonization. It was a little bit in a speculation, because of course we are living still in time of colonization, and therefore um, it was mainly uh, about uh, trying to, um, uh, to use architecture to speculate about the future. Um, but in April 2006, um, this military base that is called Oshagrab, uh, the Kronest in Arabic, um, was evacuated. And for us, it was an extremely interesting case because for the first time, we could look and to see, so what will happen the day after? Okay? This was the main question for us. Let's imagine this was very much before a speculation. And then suddenly, you know, in this specific case, was, despite the fact that it was very partial, of course, was you know, only the fact that they finished to build the wall in one side and they don't need any more this military base, but still was very interesting. Very interesting to see, for example, how all people around Bethlehem invaded the military base and you know, trying to steal whatever, you know, any material that you can find. And, and already there, I think we started to have a very interesting conversations you know, with several NGOs, with the municipality. And then, for example, one of the arguments that emerged was, no, we have to use the same checkpoint of the Israelis in order not to prevent the people actually to go and enter you know, and, and, and actually um, uh, stealing you know, materials that can actually be reused in, uh, in, the, in the area. Um, one decision that we, uh, we took in this case, and this is how it looked like after you know, some weeks in which everybody you know, went there, and even the, wa the, the water tower collapsed because they're trying to take um, iron from, from the water tower. But for us, it was very important because we say architecture can only enter after these things is over. This was a very important cathartic moment, you know, in which this violence against this building, people were in prison in this building, okay? So, in a way, we understood that there is a space between the time in which, you know, the colonizer is very much using this, for example, in this case, as a military base or as a prison, and the time in which new uses needs to be reinvented. And this time is incredibly important, you know, and, and also, in some cases, like in the case of the Mukada in Ramallah, which is at the moment now the headquarter of the Palestinian Authority, uh, is interesting to, to see how, for example, this was before a British um, military compound, 
then became a Jordanian military compound, then an Israeli military compound, and then the Palestinian military compound. So there is a contiguity. You know, how architecture has this incredible inertia, you know, that political regime change, but at the end of the day, you know, the building remains very much with the, with the same function. But in the case, for example, of the Ramallah uh, Mukata, for some months, what was very interesting, that in a way, all the people that have been uh, imprisoned there were taking families, were taking you know, friends to actually um, talk about you know, their experience in, in prison there. And also this we find is, it's a very interesting use also to, um, to talk about you know, what happened uh, in this, in, about torture, for example, which is a very uh, complicated thing you know, to when everything gets finished or you are released, is the last thing that you want to share with your family. So in that sense, the building was actually a way to, to narrate the story, in a, in a sense. And this was similarly happened also in, in the case of Oshograb. Um, and, but unfortunately, these moments, in a way, then was uh, ended, and then uh, the Palestinian Authority take over and uh, build, uh, reuse this as a prison. And unfortunately, the torture in some cases continued. So, in a way, as if the, these old uses were uh, still there, despite even if it is small scale, the political regime uh, changed. But in the case of Oshograb, I think we started to talk with the municipality and, and with them we said, you know, why you are waiting the, the colonization, you know, and the political, there will be a political solution. It's always this idea, you know, when there will be a political solution, then actually we can, um, we can start to do things, you know, we can start to plan things. But in this case, why you, you know, why you are waiting? And therefore, they, you know, take the courage and not on top of the hill, but on the side of the hill of this compound, they start to build, this is the first public park uh, that exists in Bethlehem. And it's still there. Um, and it worked, you know, since the beginning very well. However, you know, the occupation is not over, the colonization is not over. So one of, you know, the, the settlers that are around the area, they want to transform the top of the hill in uh, a new settlement, which is in fact the old story of the old colonization. So, Every time there is, was a military, they started as a military outpost, and then settlers arrive. They establish, you know, this as the first nucleus of a possible Israeli uh, settlement. Um, at that time, we resisted in a very several ways, um, mainly by playing. And this was something was a little bit strange for the soldiers because they didn't know, for example, what to do with this group of people that were actually playing bingo in this military uh, base. And then, you know, these are just images of this struggle, you know, against the settlements. So, the day they arrived, you know, they wrote, this is the name of the new settlements they want to establish, which is called Jdema. The day after we went there and we removed the graffiti, they came back. So, this was, you know, keep going for, for a long time. But I have uh, the, you know, on these sides there are militaries, you know, and as I said, there is occupation, so until, you know, they came back and... Um, reoccupied until now only the top of uh, the hill. Fortunately, the public uh, is still there. Um, but Imad, there was this guy that was on the watchtower, at a certain moment said, but you know, you have PhD, you are architects, why, I mean, why you are only um, you know, doing this form of activism? Why don't you use your own profession to, you know, to challenge what is happening there? And, of course, inspired by him, because he was saying how much Oshgrab was, in fact, a place for uh, the, the migration of the birds from north to south, we start to work on this idea of continuing the destruction of the building, continuing to perforate the building in order to allow this migration of the birds actually to rest. And one of the challenges was you know, to imagine that, in fact, the rehabilitation of Oshigrab is not, in this case, uh, take back by humans, but actually is the nature that, in a way, is reinvading uh, this place, so that architecture became a place uh, for uh, birds to, um, to nest there. These are some of the images that, um, that we produce to think about um, how to transform this military base in an environmental center. And now, I guess, um, what we would like to do is um, um, showing a, a video, and then I think Sandy will, uh, will continue.
another. And tonight we are particularly happy because we didn't know that the author of the video, she's here, which is Cressida. Um, so can we play the video now? Maybe we, do, we will not play all of it because maybe it's uh, a little bit too long and maybe then... Um, much time. We have time? Yes. But we then 15 minutes. No. No, are you willing to spend a bit more time with us? Because the issue that we still did not even begin to speak about our recent work. It's only because otherwise we can skip to the... No, we have in total, we have still 15 minutes. My God, I took so much time. I took more? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. No. Yeah? Okay, let's let's go the video. Yeah, live. The 1948 ceasefire lines between Israel and Jordan had been drawn on a 1 to 20,000 scale map by the two military commanders Moshe Dayan and Abdullah Al-Tal. Meeting in an abandoned house in Jerusalem, they laid out the map on the floor. Each drew a line using a different coloured grease pencil. Dayan used green and Al-Tal red. The thickness and softness of the coloured pencils resulted in lines that were generally three to four millimetres wide. But, because the floor under the map was uneven, in some areas of Jerusalem, the width of the line became wider. This ambiguous legal space, a few millimetres wide on the map and more than a hundred metres wide in real space, was a consequence of the materialisation of the law. In the following years, the physical extent of the width of the lines became a subject of debate, which carries on to this day. Historian and former deputy mayor of Jerusalem, Maron ben Venisti, famously asked, who owns the width of the line? Mathematically, a line has no thickness. It is a one-dimensional trajectory. In this case, however, abstract law and mathematics became a three-dimensional object when they encountered materiality. But this was the problem in relation to all historical plans for partitioning Palestine. They not only divided the land into a non-contiguous patchwork of territories, but also gave rise to a new spatial condition. Between the divided territories, another space has unintentionally emerged, and its expanse was a product of the map drafting process. It was the very width of the partition lines themselves. Several decades later, in the early 1990s, the cartographic work undertaken during the Oslo negotiations was conducted digitally, but the maps, signed by Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, were printed in hard copy. Separation lines were now drawn throughout and across the West Bank. The lines were just over a millimetre wide. In real space, the line acquired a width of about five meters. When the Oslo negotiations collapsed, the lines remained an open legal problem, bringing back the question, who owns the thickness of the line? Paradoxically, 
the question challenged the very partition these lines enacted. These thin slivers of extraterritorial space are ubiquitous throughout the West Bank. They run at the margins of almost every town and village. As we walked along these lines, we thought that with Israel and the Palestinian Authority, Israel's powerless collaborator, each exercising control over a side of the line, the thickness of the line could itself be seen as all that remains of Palestine. A common extraterritorial zone containing a sample of all the types of spaces. Walking along the lines, we encountered a series of legal conflicts that exemplified the borderline disorder of the area. The suggestion that the thickness of the line generated a legally undefined zone emerged as a legal question at the end of 2009 in the small village of Batir, west of Bethlehem. Built by a US-based Palestinian in a breathtakingly eclectic style, and known locally as the Red Castle, Israel claimed that it was partially invading Area C, the area fully controlled by Israel and where Palestinian construction is prohibited. The line ran right through the living room and bathrooms, dividing the house into two parts, or, in fact, in three. The thickness of the line was in some undefined extraterritorial status, The house was not demolished, but this sliver of architectural scale extraterritorial space has haunted us ever since. In the northern part of occupied Jerusalem, we found another house traversed by yet another line. This time it was the border of the Jerusalem municipality, unilaterally expanded two weeks after the occupation of the West Bank in June 1967. As residents of Jerusalem, the couple was given temporary Israeli IDs, which, under the logic of Israeli colonization, provide more access to public welfare and a greater freedom of movement. But the state wanted to excise the couple from the city altogether, along with many other Palestinians. The Labour Court of Jerusalem was tasked with arbitrating this issue and commissioned a surveyor to draw the exact location of the line in relation to the house. The result, 51.2% of the property was outside of the Jerusalem jurisdiction area, which left 48.8% of the property inside it. The court assigned no thickness to the line and left the couple out of Jerusalem. The most challenging situation we encountered along multiple partition lines was that of the Palestinian parliament, located in Abu Dis, just outside the 1967 unilaterally declared borders of the city. Or so we thought. The building was both a construction site and a ruin. It was destroyed neither by military violence nor by natural deterioration but by the failure of the politics of the peace process. The project to build a parliament began in 1996, during the euphoria of the Oslo Accords. The choice of the location of the building was the product of political manoeuvring. Abu Dis, once a village, now the closest town to Jerusalem's old city, was chosen for a good reason in order to demonstrate that the building was positioned as close as possible to the old city. The Palestinians claimed that they have located the building in such a way that one of its edges abutted the borderline itself. However, in 2010, Khalil Tufakji, a Palestinian cartographer and member of the Palestinian negotiation team, describes Dadar a project of cartographic subversion. Intentionally, he claims, a part of the parliament will be inside Jerusalem. People thought that the parliament was built in Abu Dis, he explained, not in Jerusalem. 
but he wanted to break Israel's taboo, that it is forbidden for Palestinian political institutions to build in Jerusalem. Locating the building over the line was to stake a Palestinian claim over Jerusalem. Three years after the collapse of the Oslo Accords, with the wall constructed just a few meters from the building, all this complexity was anyway lost. The building, in its entirety, was left outside the concrete and effective borders. The Palestinian parliament is haunted by its predecessor in the Palestinian parliaments in exile which sought to account for a scattered and extraterritorial polity, a polity in conflict, without the possibility of arranging for a census on the base of which proportional representation could be organised. These robust and sometimes controversial parliaments in exile survived precisely because their gatherings had no fixed seats. Territorialised, it would have become an easy prey to Israeli politics. <coughs> Taking Dar through the precise location of the line in the interior of the parliament building, Tufakji explained that a narrow strip, as wide as the borderline itself, was left in a legal limbo. In Tahir, the cleaning of the square as many commentators mentioned, is what turned it from being a public space, the space of the regime, into an effective political common. As a gesture recalling this move, we have ourselves engaged with an act of cleaning. With this gesture, we sought to both continue, but also challenge the cartographic subversion undertaken by the builders of the parliament. Carefully measuring and tracing the line that Tufakji had drawn inside the building, we swept and polished it clean, producing a one-to-one -one scale architectural drawing right through the thick layer of ten-year-old dirt and bird droppings. Like these droppings, the thickness of the line is the legal flotsam of the illegal process of Israeli domination. But. It is within this very apparatus of division that we find the place to start thinking about a common assembly. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I would like to, it, it's almost finished, so you will see only uh, the line, so you would not feel that we are interrupting something. The issue is that I would like to begin from this common ground that we are trying to build and, and what type of Palestine the day after revolution might look like, because we are all the time tend to think that Palestine is the West Bank or what the division that remains out of the West Bank, but, but Palestine is made out of a diaspora of refugees that are in, in refugee camps. And eventually, if we want to think Palestine through the parliament uh, eyes, then the real Palestine would stand in this line that we, we are trying to sort of uh, figure out. And, and here I think that, uh, you know, it, it was so far easy all the time to think about decolonization from the colony, no? or from the side of the Israelis, let's put it this way. But the issue that you realize by doing this, that the main colonialism is in our mind, is that we are the ones that could eventually free ourselves, and that there are a lot of discourses that we believe that it's ours, like the way we speak about the right of return, the way we speak about refugees, the way we speak about refugee camps, that seems to be as if they are 
pure Palestinians, but, but at the end they are not, because it, it's, it's a whole discourse and representation that are imposed on us by colonialism at, at the point that you don't understand anymore what's yours, which is where, are, where, where the colonialism finish and where, the, where you are finished. And, and it's from there that we begin very much to first of all understand where the Palestinian collectivity stands. And I will try to explain because, you know, the, the, the colonialism, one of the main aim normally of colonialism is to kill any sort of public space. And killing the public sp space means it is the physical manifestation of killing what remains out of the colonized collectivity, because th from the moment that they manage to kill this, then they sort of confined you in your private space. And, and here, I mean, and if you look at Palestine, it's so clear that there is no public space, and it's, it's a phenomena that exists also in the Arab world, and it's enough, you know, sometimes you hear this... Um, uh, they say that says you know Arabs are so clean inside their homes and and they are so unclean <laughs> outside of their uh, outside of their homes and and somebody should tell me actually why Arabs and non Arabs should clean the space of their enemy of or if their regimes I mean if 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 you if your relation with the power is not a sort of good relation. If you hate the power, if you hate Mubarak, or you hate the Israeli occupation, or you hate your regime, why should you clean eventually what is theirs? And and there is no ownership on 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 these places. So in in a sense, I think that there is a total crisis in places like Palestine and in other places of how we can reimagine the public and what the public might mean. And, and the problem is that we have all the time, you know, this Western plazas in mind. And it, it's our, I mean, our own imaginary and all of us in, in many ways, especially in the South, we sort of dream the Berlin Plaza and, and the fact that we can come out and you have this clean public spaces. And as architects, you know, all the time you have this, uh, you know, I, I, I studied architecture and I taught architecture. And, and all the time you have this feeling that if you design a public space, then you are a good guy. No, in, in, a, in a sense, it, it's it's uh, while while you 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 work in Palestine and you have this uh, feeling that the public space was one of the main instrument of first of all killing the society and secondly expropriating all what was in common between colonized people through the colonizer. So this naivety of thinking that the public space is only a good thing is absolutely I mean needs to be a bit revised, especially within architecture and urban planning uh, uh, faculties. But in, in that sense, I, I mean, I want to skip, unfortunately, a whole discourse about the right of return and about, because in, 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 in a sense, you know, refugee camps were all the time used as the symbol of the Palestinian willing to come back to their homes. So this means that these refugee camps supposed to be uh, actually erased fully, tabula rasa, in order for Palestinians to come back home. And, and here where I speak about colonialism, mind colonialism, we never manage to understand how eventually the 65 years of exile might be part of our narration of return. Because the issue is that, you know, you should stay as refugee, you should stay poor, you should stay marginalized, you should actually represent the way that the world would perceive a refugee. A refugee should be by force, somebody without shoes eventually, with a dirty uh, face. And this is how the world will recognize the refugee. It's never, the world cannot recognize a strong refugee. And in that sense, Palestinians, unfortunately, actually accepted this way of describing refugees and adapted a political strategies where refugees suppose all the time to be a dirty place without sewages, even though if it's not anymore like this, but still in our political representation, we tend, if we have international 
community coming to visit refugee camps. You have, you know, we work in a refugee camp where in less than half kilometer square, you have 40 NGOs, very strong and powerful community. And whenever you come as a visitor, the only thing that we try to, or people there try to show you, is the small, tiny remain place, a street that is without sewages. And, and I doubt that we kept it this way in order to show that there is part of the camp that is without sewages. And this was all the time, the way, you know, we built houses, we built three floor houses, we built four floor houses, and we are still convinced that we are roofless in the refugee camps. And, and here it's, it's a matter of, you know, in, in that sense, and I all the time tell this story of that when Palestinians uh, at the beginning replaced the tent with uh, walls, they arrived to the roof. And then when they arrived to the roof, they questioned among each other, if we will build the roof, this would mean that we accept that we stay here and, and that would jeopardize our right to return back home. And the uh, answer was yes in the 50s. We should not build the roof. Even if we are obliged to, obliged to build it, we should convince the world that we never built the roof. So the whole idea of the refugee camps was that it is a roofless place. So five, seven years ago, actually, working in uh, different parts of, of refugee camps, uh, we were in Fawar refugee camp. And uh, actually, one of the things that come out is that you know, participation and uh, all these uh, discussions. And of course, people say we want places where our kids could play. And especially women and kids, I have to say that they asked specifically that they want the plaza inside the camp because normally all what is built outside the camp is for young, uh, you know, males above 14 years old. So the challenge was how can we create a plaza inside the refugee camp? And this is actually the first plaza among the 59 refugee camps in all over the Middle East. And I have to say that as soon as we say we want to think about the plaza, there was a total uh, panic in the, in the refugee camp. And the question was, if the houses are roofless, what, what, I mean, what is the meaning of building a public space? Is it really the last stage of accepting that we are totally normalizing our situation inside the refugee camp and we accept to settle? So this was the main question is that, and, and my question to them was, is it, can we look, and I mean it's still open questions, it's not, there is no answer for these questions. Could we look at the plaza as a space of, of our beginning of building our collectivity in order actually to be able to understand who we are and where do we want to return back to? And, and this is, I mean, it's still a very, these two questions come all the time together, but I would like to tell you very quickly and then I finish, I think. I, is very quickly, the story of this plaza, when we came there, and, and of course they were panicking, plaza yes, plaza no, and we arrived to the point that yes, we want to embark into this uh, challenge, and uh, uh, then we arrived to a point that they were asking for a closed plaza. And again, I mean, coming out of uh, architectural discipline and having Berlin Plaza in mind, I mean, you all the time feel that the plaza is supposed to be the place where, where you happen by chance and that it's unpredictable place, everything might happen in the public space. But actually, people in Fawar exactly ask the contrary of this and says, in, in, in Arabic, there is a proverb says that you should not happen by chance in this plaza, and what does that mean? That means maybe if, if we can, I don't know if we have only the, and, and that would mean that if you are walking in the camp and you come to the plaza, you should not find yourself by chance inside the plaza. And, and they wanted specifically four walls and four doors in order for them to do the act of entering the plaza. And why this? I mean, we, in, in the camp, there is no public. So the UN is, is a sort of, uh, you know, um, managing uh, the camp, though they are saying we don't manage. So in, in that sense, they are only cleaning the camp, but, but they don't manage. So the way is that how people could create inside the camp, could create a system of responsibility. And, and they gave me a very simple example. They say, imagine there is a pregnant woman 
She's walking by chance in the street, and one of the kids hit her with a football. Who, who is this? The, who, who takes this responsibility? But if the woman would decide to get by herself and to do the act of entering the plaza, we will claim as a community that she's supposed to know that there are kids playing in this plaza. So the act, I mean, the taking the responsibility and the act of entering the plaza was for them a crucial element in order to be able to self-organize themselves. And, and this for me was a really a shifting point. And, and then looking at it, and I didn't realize actually that what we were doing at the end is a roofless plaza, because in that sense, we built four walls without the roof. And, and this was the whole idea of how you can build a roofless camp, and what is the meaning of a roofless camp. And here, a lot of discussion came after, because this is a very, very conservative refugee camp. And uh, when seven years ago, I, and, and we had videos, we exhibit this in several uh, parts of, of the world, that women were telling me that they will never go out for a coffee and a tea in the plaza, that this is not part of their uh, uh, culture, and this is not possible. And, uh, and then, I mean, they were telling me this while I was drinking coffee with them in the plaza. And I was just like, why? I mean, what is... What is, we are sitting here, and they say, but our husband doesn't know that we were sitting here. And we were surrounded by men, and, but the main problem is that women themselves are convinced that they should not do it. It's not, we, we all the time put the problem on our husbands or our brothers or whatsoever, but sometimes the issue comes out of the, of the women themselves, and actually we, and this is, I will never speak about it, we, fought, we established a university inside the refugee camp called Campus in Camps. If you are interested, you can go and see it. But two of these participants of Campus in Camps are from uh, Fawa refugee camps. Both of them are uh, uh, females. And, and they begin this project called the right of the woman to be in the public space. And actually, we cook together in the plazas. I was uh, last uh, week together with them jogging in the plaza, running in the plaza, and, and slowly, slowly you sort of realize, and they sort of realize, that more they are in the plaza, more people get used to this idea of, you know, women inside the plaza, and that it's enough they are a group of women in order to do so. So this was something that actually uh, was very clearly there, and, and the whole idea of how you... Uh, in contexts where you have colonization, colonizer, colonized people, where the public space is the first thing. I mean, during the first intifada, Israel closed universities and, and, uh, and schools, and if three people will gather together in, in any place, this would be considered an illegal uh, act. So we are speaking in a place where there was an attempt of extermination of the public space. And, and when the Palestinian Authority came, there was no process of understanding eventually how Palestinians could rethink back their, uh, uh, their public spaces. I mean, we designed also a school in a refugee camp. We designed many uh, other projects that unfortunately, I mean, I would love to stay much more with you to tell you more about it. But uh, we will open the discussion and then eventually we can um, answer questions. Uh, related to this. So, thank you both very much. I'm going to ask you one time. So, let's open the meeting was to in both states. And I'll ask you to put the campus and camps uh, website up. So, just a second, I'm going to ask you to put up. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Deepak. Uh, I have just two points to um, ask both of you. Uh, one, I'm very curious to know, I think before the decolonizing architecture, you started with stateless nation uh, for the Biennale in 2003. So when I read about it, it was quite disturbing to find that, you know, the how you came up with the idea of putting up passports. So if you can explain that, you know, uh, it would, that would be interesting. To the one point which you had, uh, Sandy, you just pointed out, uh, what also I've been reading about, not just your work, about other allied areas also, 
um, especially when people who are under occupation, even if you want to bring certain perspective in mind, in, you know, or uh, to them, one problem always we found actually, when people are under occupation, they're feeling that, you know, what do I do? Do I have a role to make some changes? So more than, um, you know, th so there's a certain requirement or mandate to decolonize the mind. So in your all the projects, especially, you have attracted a lot of incredible minds across the world. So what exactly you have done to maybe include the local um, and people out there in the Palestine, et cetera, and also to help them to come out and contribute to your project? I mean, more of a, I would like to know the decolonizing the mind before decolonizing the architecture. And a bit about the stateless nation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ajita, and I found it very interesting when you were talking about how, you know, when some when you colonize a place, the first thing you do is appropriate public space and restrict people's access to it and say, you know, not more than three people can gather and things like that. Now, when there's a sort of obvious colonizer that's very obvious, right, like in the case of Palestine, and I don't, I don't even want to begin to compare this to democratic countries, but what we've been perhaps seeing over the last five, six years, since maybe 2008, is that, you know, just because we live in a democratic country and we go and all of us think just because we vote, we are not colonized, we're not, you know, we have that freedom. But what we're seeing with a lot of protests is that across the world, whether it's, um, you know, the Occupy movement, whether it's the Ferguson protest, is that what we think is public space and what we think is that right to protest has been getting more and more and more restrictive even in supposedly democratic places and I'm just I mean I'm just trying to relate that sort of architectural strategy of controlling public spaces we've been seeing that amount of control even in very democratic places and just like Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, um, what I was trying to understand also, among many other things, is you show a wide range of spatial practices. You know, demolishing is a spatial practice, reconstructing, drawing, cleaning. So, and in the, in the whole conversation, I was trying to understand what you mean by architecture. Uh, I mean, there's quite a number of things came through, you know, for instance, uh, uh, the the, uh, so for instance, just I'm giving an example, like as a, as, a, as a means to live there, right? I mean, the very existential way that you stated is amazing. So what does it mean? What do you mean by architecture? I'm really curious to know that. Two days with Jairaj, you know that's a classic Jairaj question. Um, so I'm just going to add one thing. Yes, is the thing. One is to invite you to close by telling us a little bit about campus and camps in the dictionary. But... You know, just to complete that echo, I think one of the ways in which it strikes me it's so important is to not also buy into the exception narrative when it comes to talking about Palestine. Right? Just to not to sort of say this place where anything can happen because it's not the norm. Because the truth is, in the contemporary moment, Palestine is so normative of the experience of so many political formations in the world. Um, you know, the question about occupation, I mean, we have... There is, the, there is the stretching of the concept to think about the income poor in the city, but there is the very literal urban history in India of occupation in the Northeast and in Kashmir. And urbanization in a place like Mizoram, done in the 70s with forced military grouping on the basis of tribe to create cities, I mean, there's a reason why the Northeast is the most urbanized part of the country, and it's because of a classic military-controlled spatial change. I mean, there is nothing else but occupation under um, army law that suspends democratic resistance. I mean, there, it, I mean, it's not a metaphor, is what I'm trying to say. So I think in many cases, there are th this, these, the nation state containers of democracy have become so, un, in many ways, so meaningless as almost spatial containers as opposed to places of content. 
and the historical parallel for us, for the idea of public space being belonging to the other, that for a long time in India, you never spoke of the city. Right? We had a, you know, uh, an, uh, and it was very much because the city was the space of colonial play, the belonging. Now, this was partly a discursive trick, not exactly true, right? but what happens is that the, the narrative that we had, particularly around our decolonization struggles, was that the authentic Indian lived somewhere else. Right. So the journey to the city was always ambiguous. So the public spaces were always colonial. Some of them very literally, because in dual city architecture and planning, when you look at a city like Delhi, where I'm from, New Delhi, that central space, is British built. Right. Town in Bombay is British built. Now, these are easy generalizations, because they undo when you look more closely at the ground. But there is very much a notion of the city itself being an unsure answer in terms of where one should live and what kind of person or human one should be. So the ethical certainty of the city, unlike in modernization theory and in development, saying that this is where you must end, this is where all the civilization and development modernity goes to, you know, to teach urban theory and modernity together. The ethical, certain of the city, ethical certainty of the city in India has never been a given. It still is not a given. You know? And so the question really about even the question of the slum or the basti is, what is the right that comes from there? It's not always the right to remain. It's often the right to come and go on one's terms. It's often the right to belong in multiple places. It's often the right to refuse the idea of migration for multiple mobility. So it's not just, it's about belonging here and here and choosing on one terms those kinds of settlements, which unsettles all our notions of modern planning, for certain, right? Because planning doesn't like it when people don't behave and stay in place. It unsettles us deeply, it annoys us, you know? And it's just, we drew you here, goddammit. You know, and that, but I think that that larger project, not just of unsettling democracy, but of unsettling this fait accompli, that the urban is it. We will end up there. So the only question is, what kind of city should we make? As opposed to say, should we be making a city at all? Um, yeah, maybe I would just try to to combine uh, this to last comment on. Um, on how this notion of, of public space today, it's, get, uh, it's very complicated. And, um, and I, yeah, I, I totally agree that in a sense, uh, Palestine is not an exception, it's just maybe a more extreme form, or uh, you know, certain things are, are more clear, but, um, but they share the same, um, uh, the same nature with uh, all the places. And one example is exactly on this, um, period of 2011, you know, when a series after Tunis, Cairo, you know, a, a series of events were somehow um, trying to reshape the, the very nature of, of these public spaces, um, but also re revealing, revealing also the, that um, what we are, were used to think about the public spaces as the place in which the citizens' rights are represented symbolically, and uh, you know, in all its its architectural form too. Um, um, actually, they are uh, totally today under control of a state that is obsessed with security and control. And one example of this was exactly, if you remember, um, in Zuccotti Park, the uh, Zuccotti Park, the old story. It was that. Um, um, it's a, this group of people were trying to, you know, occupy and to stay in certain specific places. Most of them were parks, but as you know, public spaces, and especially parks, they have, you know, a certain moment they close. And this was the way in which people, you know, police was uh, able to remove uh, people from these places because they were public. Now the question is, why do you think in Sukkoti they may they make it to stay? because in fact, was not public and not private space. Zuccotti is a result of this um, regulation in New York that allowed um, the owner of the building to uh, have, you know, to build maybe 10 floors more if they offered to the city a public space. But legally, this is not public. At the same time, it was not completely private because it, and I think this ambigu ambiguity in a way allowed at that time the people actually to, uh, to occupy that place. And this is why in a way this resonates a little bit with this work that we try to do in these cracks and that in a way are showing 
also the potentiality of, of the common, you know, and bringing back this, it, that in a way we, are, we should not be polarized anymore by to this category. You know, it's, things are either public or private. The idea of now what is happening, interestingly, is the discussion about you know, the commons is, is a way to reclaiming different form of collectivity that are not just public. Uh, and all these cracks, I think, you know, demonstrate in this, um, you know, what happened also in, in Tahrir Square, the ambiguity of, of the space and the potentiality of, of trying to redefine them and, and to uh, politicize them. Um, well, of course, in relation to this, for example, one very difficult discussion we had when we, uh, um, you know, at that time we were in New York discussing, you know, with the group that they were really wanting to use this word of occupation, we were saying, you know, from where we are, this, we don't know why we, you want to use this word. You have to question. This goes back a little bit also to the idea of collective dictionary, you know? Because for us, occupation is the fact that you occupy something that you don't own. And we said, you know, these are our space. Why we have to call this movement occupying, you know, movement, whatever, no? You are occupy, I mean, military occupy a space, you know, a state to occupy or, you know, anti occupy something that they feel they don't know. Even the Israeli, they know that they are occupying something that they don't own. They, it's not theirs. I mean, ownership is even another thing. But let's say it's not, it's not theirs. So this is why we were challenging them to say, from our perspective, you are using absolutely a wrong term. Because, you know, you are defining yourself as the one that illegal, you are already, you know, making your own subjectivity in relation to this negativity of occupying something that you should not do it because you are occupying an illegal, and you are already defining yourself as illegal. Meanwhile, you should say, you know, this is our space. This is, you know, we come first, and then, you know, all the regulations and, 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 and all the things are coming after. Um, so this is how, how to say, I mean, how sometimes we, it would be important, and I think we did, we tried to do that also today, to to bring these definitions from one place to another in order to destabilize these meanings in all ways, you know. So in order to, to challenge, you know, words that we use without, you know, fully thinking that if these are the correct words. No, I don't know. The question of architecture, I think that, uh, you know, being architect in, in order to uh, break your borders, you, you, you love to think that architecture is everything. I mean, our mind is... is uh, made out of a certain architecture, and, and when we decolonize our mind, we de I think that we decolonize uh, the architecture of our mind. And, and, and when we speak about the architecture of the day after, it's much more how we can imagine the society of the day after, how we can imagine you know, the institutions of, of, of the day after. Because one of the things that DAR is, is very much, and Campus in Camps is trying to do, we never worked out, totally outside of the uh, institution. We never isolate ourselves. I mean, this work was done inside the UN. Uh, we work from inside the university. And, and we believe that the only way that you can seriously sort of decolonize and deconstruct and change is through working not in isolation and, and this pure, uh, pure, puristic way of doing things and that, you know, what we are is a sort of, uh, we have this naivety of thinking that what we do, Palestine learn us, I mean, teach us that any position you take is all the time taking a position. There is nothing called neutrality. I mean, I don't believe absolutely in neutrality. And most of the time when you are neutral, you are simply supporting the strong part of the equation. So if you don't take position, you are taking a position. And, and in that sense, we believe that by uh, deconstruction by, by the deconstruction of institutions, this is the way that we sort of intend architecture. It's, it's never out of scratch. It's never out of, it, it's all the time sort of trying to redefine who we are and, and how we can position ourselves to what exists already. Uh, join me very much in thanking Sandra.